you. You may be seated. All right, let's take our Bibles tonight and let's go to the book of Mark, chapter number 9, if we could. Mark, chapter number 9. There was a very unusual funer military funeral in California back on December of 2013. Sergeant First Class Joseph Gannett, who fought in both World War II and the Korean War, was laid to rest. He had been captured in Korea back in 1950 and died the following year, but his body was not returned for many years and his death was never confirmed by the North Koreans. His wife, Clara, waited for decades for her husband to come back. She regularly went to meetings with government officials seeking information about what had happened. Clara even bought a house and had it professionally landscaped so that all Joseph would have to do when he came home was go fishing. She was 94 years old when his remains were finally brought home for a military funeral with full honors. It wasn't the homecoming she dreamed of, but she finally knew his fate. Clara told a reporter who interviewed her, he told me if anything happened to me, he wanted me to remarry. And I told him, no, no, here I am, still his wife, and I'm going to remain his wife until the day the Lord calls me home. Love, true godly love, is not temporary or transient. Love is a commitment that is meant to last. Love is not based on everything going right or always being happy. Love is not emotional feeling, but rather a choice of the will. Casual commitments do not produce a foundation for deep and meaningful relationships. Instead, we should love others as God loves us with an unfailing love that never ends. You know, that story illustrates so well the permanence God had in mind when it comes to this thing of marriage. In our text here today, Jesus is asked about the subject matter, and it comes up, uh, and he gives us some insight about God's thoughts about it. Mark chapter 10, verse 1, it says, And he came, and he rose from thence, and cometh into the coasts of Judea by the farther side of Jordan. And the people resort unto him, and as he was wont, he taught them again. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him? And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the creation God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh, so then they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God had joined together, let not man put asunder. And the house, his disciples asked him again of the same matter. And he saith unto him, Whosoever shall put away his wife, and marry another, committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband, and be married to another, she committeth adultery. Tonight we're going to look at this passage a little bit more closely as we talk about the permanence of God's plan. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the passage tonight. And Lord, I do pray that uh, it would be enlightening to us in, in a variety of ways. And, and Lord, that we've got a lot of different people in different positions here tonight, and, and I pray that there's something for each one of us uh, that would be a help as uh, we approach this subject matter. May you get all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as we see, Jesus came into the region of Judea, and the crowds once again began to flood around him, and he was, as he was wont to do, he, he taught them. He was always uh, taking advantage of the opportunity to tell people about the truths of the Word of God. And as his custom was, he was, he was teaching, but of course, whenever God's trying to do something, don't mark it down, the devil is going to come in and, and, and never let it alone. He's going to try to stir up trouble and cause issues wherever he can, and always has people he uses to do such. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse, uh, this, uh, or chapter two, verse 2, it says, Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the devil, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The devil's got people that he will use, he'll stir up and, and create problems, and uh, will, that will get up in arms over something that the Lord's trying to do. It always happens. As God's plans march forward, the devil is always trying to oppose them in some, uh, some capacity. And uh, we've seen that uh, a number of times here in the book of Mark. You see it all over the Bible, really. When God's trying to go forward, the devil is going to do what he can to try to create problems, stir up issues, create confusion, and try to dissuade people from, uh, from following the Lord. Now, as we've seen with the Lord Jesus Christ, one of the major tools of the devil were those religious Pharisees. They were always a problem. They, they came across as appearing as something righteous.
righteous, but of course Jesus really challenged what they taught and the way they practiced things. And it's ironic that it would be religious people that would cause the greatest amount of problems, but usually that's the way it amounts to be. Uh, what you have is religious but lost people, people that want to appear a certain way so that they can do certain things instead of just full-heartedly follow the Lord. And uh, if, if you were uh, like that before you were saved, you know, what you, you know that um, religiosity never saves you and doesn't give you a right relationship with God. You need to be born again, as it were. These guys, they were unsaved. Some of them would eventually get saved. There would be Joseph of Arimathea. There would be Nicodemus. And there also mentions others, some chief priests that had gotten saved and so forth. But oftentimes there were, there were those that just created problems for the Lord. And they approached the Lord, of course, with a question. I believe one meant to make him look bad or at least cause, a, cause some friction amongst those that he was teaching. It mentions that in verse 2. And the Pharisees came to him and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife? In other words, divorce her. And notice the next phrase, tempting him. You know, they, again, this wasn't a sincere question. I've had questions thrown at me over the years about a variety of different subjects, and not all of them are sincere. And, uh, and they're just trying to pick at you. And when, I, and when I start noticing that people want to just pick at things and try to find fault, I just don't even go there. You know, there's no point of arguing with anybody. Uh, because if, it, if it's to the point where you're just trying to find something wrong, then you know what? Uh, you have determined you're not teachable. You've determined you just want to win. And, and that's not an attitude of humility. That is an attitude of pride. It's an attitude of pride. And that's what this was. It's just an attitude of pride. Uh, they, 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 you know, hey, Jesus, uh, uh, is it lawful for us to put away our wives? Is that, is that an okay thing? Could, this, could we divorce our spouse and you, God would have no problem? Well, as Jesus was common or often did, he, he asked the question back. Because he, he wants to get their thinking going. In verse 3, and he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement to put her away. Say, he did? I believe what he's referring to is in Deuteronomy chapter 24. I'll show this to you quick. Deuteronomy chapter number 24. This was at the end of Moses' life, and and uh, he, he has this penned, and I, and I believe this is based on the research I, I pulled up. This is probably the passage that they're referring to. It says in verse 1, When a man hath taken a wife and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he hath found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and send her out of his house. And when she is departed out of his house, she may go and to be another man's wife. If the latter husband hate her, and write her a bill of divorcement, and give it in her hand, and sendeth her out of the house. Or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, his, her former husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that she is defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord, and thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. In other words, it seems that Moses allowed or suffered, as it were, uh, this to take place. How does one describe this? So I, I like what uh, commentary Matthew Henry said. He said, this is that permission which the Pharisees erroneously referred to as, as a precept. And it references Matthew 19, which is a sister passage. We'll see a little bit here in a moment. It said, Moses commanded to give a writing of divorcement. It was not so. Our Savior told them that he only suffered it. In other words, he just allowed it because the hardness of their hearts, lest if they had not had liberty to divorce their wives, they should have ruled them with rigor and it may be have been the death of them. It is probable that divorces were in use there as they are, as it's mentioned in Leviticus 21 verse 14 about uh, a priest not being able to marry a divorced lady. And Moses thought it mindful here to give some rules concerning them. In other words, all right, you're going to do this, all right, this is how you have to go about it. Remember, he was the civil law at that time. So they had, they, they had to have some sort of record keeping, so to say, on when this happens. You can't stop it all because he, he lived in an imperfect world. But the Lord goes on to explain that this was not God's initial design, was it? Look at verse 6 of our passage. 
but from the beginning of the creation. Or actually, verse 5, And Jesus answered and said to them, For the hardness of your heart he wrote this precept. In other words, he had to deal with the hardness of people's hearts, being willing to go through something like that. And uh, he goes on, and, and they had to have some sort of civil order to deal with it. And that, that's basically what it's in reference to. And Jesus answered, or excuse me, verse 6, But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God had joined together, let not man put asunder. So the Lord lays out that from the beginning that God design marriage to be a permanent thing until, if you will, till death do us part. And that they, this couple were to be joined together. Go to Genesis chapter 2. This is where it's first mentioned after Adam and Eve come together. This, uh, this concept of permanence. Uh, we, we, we'll pick it up in verse 18. We'll just kind of read the whole story here. As it's sweet, as God uh, brings Adam, uh, his wife, and it says here, And the Lord said, God said, It is not good that man should be alone. Genesis 2.18, I will make him a help me for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found and help me for him. Notice God's educational system, just as a side note. He, he allows us to come to the understanding of our need. And he has a number of ways in which he can do that. And that's what he does here with all these animals. He helped Adam understand, you know what? I need somebody. Okay, Adam, you finally realize that. So I'm going to put you in a deep sleep. And I'm going to take your rib, as you, as you know the story of verse 21. Verse 22, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. They shall be one flesh. Again, speaking of this permanency in the connection of their marriage vows. In fact, Jesus even stated further how God sees things when spouses join up with others. If you go over to Matthew chapter number 19, Matthew chapter 19 uh, and verse number 9, uh, he's speaking to the crowd here in this context. And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her, which is put away, doth commit adultery. The exception mentioned here is for fornication. Okay, it's a, and I and there's a lot of debate about what the, this means within context. So is it all? And, and and I believe I guess the take I have on it is this: in in the back of the Jewish days, they had uh, or in the times of Christ amongst the Jews, they would often have a period of time, betrothal time, where couples have committed to one another, and we would call it today as an engagement period. But, uh, but it would be a period of time before they would consummate the marriage and have that marriage ceremony and, and go from there, the actual marriage date. So they, let's just say, for instance, their, their time was about six months before that marriage ceremony. Then that they would be considered uh, married, as it were, according to Jewish law, because they've, uh, they've already committed to each other. Uh, and then, of course, the, the actual marriage itself would take place. And it, it was during that time, if you remember the story of Mary and Joseph, that, that Joseph had contemplated putting Mary away because she was pregnant with what we know to be, of course, the Christ child. He was contemplating that until the, until the uh, angel showed up and said, Joseph, it's okay to take her. It's not, she didn't cheat on you. Uh, she, is, she is carrying the Christ child. And, uh, and you can take her in to be your wife. And, of course, he goes and does that. And so that's what I, I believe is, is probably the most uh, uh, accurate way of, of uh, interpreting Matthew 19.9. Now, there are those that do believe differently. And some good people that I know that would, that would uh, disagree with that. And that's fine. That, if that's what they, they believe, that's, that's between them and God. That's believe between them and God. But I do believe the Bible does teach on the subject of permanence when it comes to marriage. Yeah. And if a person here tonight or listening online or whatever the case might be, you've been through that divorce, I'm not here to beat you up at all. I hope you understand that more than anything. It's a very touchy subject. I've, I've, I've come across people in the past who get, 
get real intense about it. And I'm not here beating up anybody who's been through that. If you've been through that, I, I'm, I'm sorry. And I, and I, and I don't, I wish that hadn't happened to you. And uh, I understand that you have pain from that, maybe. And I'm not here to pour salt on your wounds at all. God bless you for staying faithful to him, uh, even despite all that. And God, I want you to know that God still loves you, and God can still use you in some capacity. He, and uh, he'll, you guys, you can move on and, and just be the person God wants you to be. And I've seen people in those types of situations move forward, and God still used them in some capacity. And, and, and that's, that's, that's fine. But I, I do want to try to prevent anything like that happening for other people, though, too. So you've got to understand the perspective in which I'm coming from. That uh, if we can prevent that stuff from happening, that would be a good thing. I, I imagine if you have been through that type of a situation, you wouldn't want anybody else to have that kind of pain either. It, it, it's it's got to be a, a very difficult thing. So that so that's the perspective and the heart I hope you understand behind what I'm looking at here tonight. Well, after answering these Pharisees, these disciples came to Jesus and asked him a little bit further about the matter. And it seems that they were a bit concerned. It's kind of almost a little bit comical. If you go back to the Matthew 19 passage, the, the sister passage to this, you know, Jesus explains uh, these things. And verse 10 of, of Matthew 19, it says, His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man to be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. It is not good to marry. In other words, if we can't get out of it, boy, better off not doing it, right, Lord? And maybe they were all kind of looking over at Peter there, because as far as we know, he was the only one married amongst the group. Sorry, Peter, you're stuck with her. <laughs> I would never know. Ouch, right, yeah. I don't know, these guys evidently wanted to start a Bachelors for Life club, you know, type thing. <laughs> oh, Jesus, I guess we're not going there, you know, man. And uh, I've known guys who like, yeah, I'm a bachelor for life until the one comes in and then they're the putty for life. That's the kind of the way it works. I, I, I've seen that too. It's kind of comical. But Jesus is like, no, no, you're, you're not, not. Don't go that direction. He says in verse 11 of this same chapter, but he said unto them, all men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it be given. For there are some eunuchs which are are so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. In other words, there, there are people that, honestly, they, they, they need to get married, and uh, that, that's their desire, and that, that's not a bad one. Then there are some that have, that have been forced into a position of singlehood, let's just put it that way, and some have chosen it. But that, that, he's like, not everyone can receive it, so don't get this idea, you know, it's just better to be bachelor for life thing. Uh, not necessarily. Most people will have that desire, and of course some will not. Paul was an example of a man who didn't have the desire to, um, to be married. Now there's question whether or not he was, because of his position uh, as a Pharisee at some point, and some of the laws that they were, but as we follow the life of Paul, um, you know, there's no mention of a wife. In fact, 1 Corinthians 7, he, he speaks of a, uh, where there's a lot of talk about the, um, the marriage relationship and all that. He talks about people being as he was, and that was single. And, uh, of course, he devoted all of his time and attention to the Lord, and he said that's, that's one of the benefits of, of the single life, is that really it's you and the Lord, and you can give a whole much more time. Whereas when you're married, you, you have to devote specific time for that spouse in particular. But he said, you know, everyone, everyone's different, though. Everyone's got their, got their, uh, got their propensities, and, and, and that's fine. He says it's better, better to marry than to burn, as it were. In other words, fall for, for into a position of lust and, and into, into things like fornication and so forth. So it, it's going to vary between people. There are some people that are totally content, and then others that they, they feel that the Lord would have them to do that. But when it comes to marriage, though, how does one stay committed till death? You know, this thing, if, if permanence is a big deal to God, how, how do they stay committed? Well, there's lots of things I could talk about here tonight. But I'll just give us three that I think are just basic things that will help in this subject matter of the permanence of God's plan. Number one, <laughs> choose right. 
single people you thought you were going to get out of this one tonight. Uh Uh-uh, no. She was right. You know, it's better to remain unmarried than to marry and marry wrong. And there are a lot of people today that would say amen to that in our world. That they got married for the wrong reasons, from the wrong, and, and, and as a result, they're in a position today that they're not really all that thrilled about. As a single person, you, ha- you have an opportunity to learn from other people's mistakes and make good choices when it comes to this matter. It is the second most important decision that you make in your life is who you choose to marry. The number one decision is to be born again. The number two is whom you're going to marry because you are to be with that person until death do you part. And you want to make that choice right. Now, God has designed someone for you, but how do you know which person? Now, there's a lot of things that I could cover tonight on this subject matter. I'm going to keep it somewhat brief here. But number one, this should be an obvious thing. A saved person should be, you know, number one, this should be a no-brainer. But it should be a saved person. If you're a born-again Christian, it should be somebody who is saved. And may I say bearing fruit. Bearing fruit. In 2 Corinthians 6.14, But be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness? You know, marriage is a yoke. It is a covenant. And, though, uh, and it, it would not be wise <laughs> in many ways to yoke up with an unbeliever or somebody who is unsaved. Or even a person who is saved. You've got to be careful, too, because not every saved person has the same commitment level either. Because you got some saved people, that they're not committed to anything but themselves, and you got some that are sold out for God. Which one would you want to marry? I want to marry somebody who's sold out for God. I already did. Too late for me, right? Amen? <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> My wife gave me a kind of okay look back there, so that's good. I survived that one. But someone who truly, by observation, truly loves and serves the Lord is, is not doing it so all of a sudden just to impress you. And I don't believe that in the idea of what we might call dating evangelism either. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to win this people, a person to the Lord so that they come to the Lord. Can I say that doesn't generally work very well? Not without a lot of pain and agony too. There was a reason why, the Jew, why God told the Jewish people not to intermarry amongst the pagans around them. He said, no, you don't, you don't do that. Why? Because they would learn the ways of those pagans and be pulled away from it. And that's what happened to them. If you go to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 7, again, God issues this, this warning. And it's a picture for us not to, not to get involved with those who do not share our faith, or our, our God, as it were. Deuteronomy 7, verse 1, it says, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land whither thou goest to possess it, and hast cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites and the Gergesites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hevites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou, and when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. No covenant. That's what a marriage is. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto, thy, unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son, for they will turn away thy son from following me. And they, that they may serve their gods, so will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. See, they, God wasn't into... Uh, um, Dating evangelism, if I can put it that way. It's like, uh-uh, you can't, don't go their way. They will, they will pull you away, and that's what happens in the book of Judges. They began pulling people away to the point where they were, they were sacrificing to pagans. And there's a principle there. The same will happen with us. If, we, if, if a single person gets themselves involved with an unbeliever, they will be pulled away. It's, it, it's na- more natural to pull away from God than it is to pull closer to God. And it, it, it's, it's a critical uh, thing. By the way, uh, you know, be, if you're hoping to marry, as, as many 
of our singles, I'm sure, are. Be the person you want to marry. You know what I mean by that? You want to marry a godly person, you be a godly person. You want to marry a person who loves the Lord, you be a person that loves the Lord. Be committed, be faithful, serve God. Walk with Him. Be that kind of person. And God seems to know how to bring those types of people together. I'll say this much. Why would God give his best, most faithful people to somebody that is not wanting to be that? Honestly. Why would he do that? He wouldn't. Because that would be an unequal yoke. Can I encourage us today, single folks, be the person that you want to marry. And let God bring that person in in his time. I encourage you to surrender that to the Lord, that timing. By the way, you'll be a lot happier if you do. Okay. But choose right. It's better not to marry than to marry wrong and have to live the rest of your life with that. Secondly, consider responsibilities. Now, when it comes to the spouses, God lays out responsibility. We love that word, don't we? Responsibility. I think it's natural for our flesh to want to shed responsibility, right? But God in marriage wants us to take up responsibility. We have responsibilities that God lays out in his word. And it's our duty to learn what those responsibilities are and how they are to apply to me and my spouse, or me in particular as an individual, as a spouse. One thing that, that is critical about understanding marriage is that marriage is about giving instead of trying to take. We, we live in a world today where marriage is gone. People get into marriage to get something, and they don't want to give. And then when they get, to, get there, they discover that, and then they figure out, well, they think, well, I've just, I've just married wrong. No, maybe you married with the wrong motive behind it. Marriage is a lot about giving. You give up yeah, and sacrifice in that. Now, you do get blessings in return. There are benefits for being married, and there's benefits being single. But, they don't, but some of those things you, you have to sacrifice in order to be one side or the other. Marriage is much about giving than it is getting. And if both spouses sought to be the spouse God wanted them to be, troubles in marriage would be much less, at least between the two people. Now, if you go to Ephesians chapter number 5, this isn't the only place that outlines the responsibilities that God has for spouses, but, it, but it's a pretty strong spot. Whenever I think and pray about my responsibilities as it were of a husband, this, this is the passage that, that comes to my mind oftentimes. And it starts off here in verse number 22. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their own wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For, as, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Very loaded passage of information. You know, I'm just going to break it down here between the two roles here of responsibility laid out. For the wife, God states that she is to be submissive to his leadership and reverent to him. That's what the scripture says. Now, that's not what you know, modern society says. I understand they're, they're not happy. 
And, and one of the reasons for that is because some of the relationships that some of those ladies experienced as they were growing up were pretty fractured. And a lot of them have a hard time with their fathers. And this idea of submission gets really hard because they watched some, some of their fathers do some things to their mothers that they shouldn't have. And we'll get to the dad here in just a little bit. But that's why you see some of the, the, the real, no, no, I don't like that passage type thing brought up. But this is what God says. This is what God says. When it comes to submission, that doesn't mean that she says nothing and, and is a doormat. And I think any wise man would be well advised to take the input that he gets from his wife. But, but, but I do believe it, it should be something that's given with respect as the authority in the home, uh, that she would in, in give her input respectfully and, and meekly according to her husband, but leave, of course, the final decisions with him and then support him. I think that's, that's what it's talking about. I think of Esther. Esther was an incredible lady. I mean, there, there was some real, she was a real gem in a lot of ways. And can I say, she wasn't married to the greatest guy in the world either. Kind of a little bit of a bonehead of a guy. I mean, you think about Ahasuerus or Xerxes. He ruled the Medo-Persian Empire when it was at its zenith. All, and, and really, it was the beginning. It was kind of the beginning of the end. It would take a f several decades before it ever collapsed, but that was kind of the height of it. And he was doing things. Really, it appears that just he was he was a pleasure-seeking man. Let's just put it that way. But she wasn't married to a stellar guy at all. But you look at the way she approached him and the way she was. You know, she was a very submissive, humble lady. And the attitude that she presented herself activated the love that her husband had in his heart for her. Because when he found out what he had done in, in allowing Haman to authorize that decree to eradicate the Jews, he was like, oh man. And he did everything he could within his power to help out and to try to fix it. You know, I'm thankful for my wife's input. And I, I seek it often on things because she sees things that I don't see. And that's true in every marriage. That, that there's, there's, there's a lot of good input that, that a wife can give a husband. But it does tell us here, two wives, that says, submit yourselves therefore unto him. In other words, you can give input, and that's a good thing. And if you see something that's wrong, you should, you should mention it. There's nothing wrong with that. And don't be, well, I, I don't want to make my husband feel bad. You know what? Some husbands need to be made feel bad. I'm, I'm honest. Because sometimes we as guys do dumb stuff. <laughs> Thank you. I am in myself. Some, I, I, I had some bad ideas. But you know what you're going to get, you know the better response you're going to get if you come up to him and be like, what are you doing, you boneheaded, you know, type attitude? You're going to get a big old stiff arm. Or if he does follow you, he's going to despise you in his heart. And there's plenty of that that goes on. Or some guys, they just step back and they, they just, all right, and, and, they, and they let the whole thing go. That's... And, and, and they just become kind of just observers. And they won't take that, that role. The lady that nags and makes life miserable till she gets what she wants will pull down her home. Proverbs twenty-seven fifteen: A continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Pick, 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 until I get my way. You're going to perform Proverbs 14, 1. Every wise woman buildeth her house but the foolish pluck it down with their hands. The pecking doesn't work. You may get what you want, but you're going you're gonna to breed a lot of bitterness that will one day come out and boom. And you don't know, <laughs> and it will not be pretty. Reverence and submission. The husband... The responsibility. The husband gets it off easy. He's just got to love his wife. You know what that word love is? It's called, a, in the Greek, it's agape. 
And you, know, you notice here, husbands love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. What did Jesus do for the church? He died for it. What does that tell us? It tells us that he is to love his wife sacrificially. He, he, he needs to be willing to sacrifice himself for the well-being and security of his of his bride. Look at verse 29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Nourish and cherish. Those are strong words, aren't they? It speaks of, of, of like how you would almost uh, uh, pamper something, if you will, to, to make it blossom. And to cherish. In other words, to treat it as you would a very valuable piece a very valuable object. I hate to use the word object to describe wife. I'm not. I don't mean it in that negative of term, but 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 something that you would you would hold very dear to yourself, that you wouldn't want anything to touch or damage or or harm. Nourish and, and cherish. It talks about taking care of your spouse, providing for the spouse's needs, both physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Listening to the spouse and coming to know who she is so that you can best meet whatever need that there is. We are to put her needs ahead of our own. That's the sacrifice. And if it even comes to the point of giving our own lives to protect. 1 Peter 3.7 Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge. In other words, get to know who they are. Because every, every lady's different. Every lady, you know, sometimes ladies get generalized in categories and men get generalized into categories and things like that. So we just automatically assume that's the way my wife or my husband's going to be. Well, guess what? You get married and you discover Oh, I guess my wife doesn't like flowers as much as other women do. Oh, I didn't realize that my wife didn't, uh, would prefer to do this versus this. My wife doesn't like to shop, really? You know, sometimes those are general characteristics that sometimes we get to some, some, gender, some, some of the different gender roles, but, but that's not always true with every wife, and our every husband, that is. And that's why they spend a lifetime getting to know each other. And, and, and getting to understand who they are, the likes and the dislikes, and, and the things that make them happy and the things that make them not so happy, if you will. Basically, the husband is called to be selfless. And that goes against his nature of being selfish. Self, selfless. You know, it's really hard for a lady to want to even be submissive when she can't trust what her husband is going to do next either. Guys, if you're kind of all over the map, you're creating a lot of st instability in your home. And it's, it's hard for somebody to just follow that all the time. You, and, and if you have issues, maybe you need to step back and say, am I just being a dingle fritz and just kind of going all over the place? One time I'm doing this, next time I'm doing this, and they're completely opposite. You know what? Maybe it's time to get before the Lord and figure out what God wants you to do instead of just grasping for straws. And you're going to have problems in your marriage if, if you're just bouncing over like a pinball and not taking a, a significant lead. It's very hard for a lady to be submissive when, when her, she can't trust her husband with the finances. Doesn't know where, where, where it's going to come through next. You know, stability and security are big things for ladies. It's big, they're big things for them. They're looking to you for security. But if all we care about is our hobbies, interests, and jobs, and other things that we like, you're not going to be able to build a very strong marriage. That's, that's breaking what this is talking about, loving your wives and nourishing and cherishing them. There's not to say there isn't time for those things, but you know what? She should know that she's above those things. The reason our marriages grow cold is because we as men need to learn a lot about romance and what that means outside the bedroom 
and keep the fires lit in our marriages. I have admit, I have got a lot to learn myself. Say, so what if my spouse, though, whether you're talking to the husband or wife, isn't doing their responsibilities? I got a very easy answer for you. Do yours. And let God deal with them. By the way, maybe God needs to change you and I by making us do what we're supposed to do first, even when it's not easy. And the other spouse isn't doing their side of the of the of the coin as it were we're responsible for us not for our spouse we're not going to change our spouse only god can do that but he won't do it if we're not going to change ourselves our marriages will be subject to breaking up if these responsibilities aren't taken seriously <laughs> finding out what our responsibilities are based on how the way god designed it well thirdly and finally i'm gonna have to go a lot quicker here through this, but commit regardless. When we get married, we make a covenant between the person we're, going, we're, we're marrying and God. And we say those vows, in sickness and in health, richer or poorer, etc., 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 until death do us part, right? However, we live in a world that doesn't really want to stick to their promises. And God expects us to keep our promises. It mentions in Ecclesiastes 5, verses 4 through 5, when thou vowest a vow unto God, defer not to pay it, for he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. Better it is that thou shouldest not vow than that thou shouldest vow and not pay. When we approach the marriage altar, we're promising to give our all to that one person for a lifetime. And in some cases, there will be challenge, real challenges that come up in those amongst our lifetimes. Spouses can get sick, they can get hurt, you can face financial ruin, you can have upheavals that weren't expected. You know, when everyone gets married, they, everyone's expecting it, we're going to live hap happily ever after. But the reality is you're going to have bumps along the way. And some may be harder than others. What do you do at those points? For some, they, at those moments, they just kind of give up on it. Now, there are things that are outside of our control, and sometimes they're the result of our decisions. But when we go to the altar, we have decided that we're gonna st we are going to do this together with God's help. We'll face what life throws at us together as a team. As a team. We'll pick each other up when we fall. We'll love each other, even though we can be unlovely at times. And I'll guarantee you, every marriage has the husband or the wife being not so lovely at times. And I'll not leave you even if and when we walk through the trials of life. That's commitment. That's commitment. And too many times what we see in our world around us is too many fair weather fans. When things just don't go right the way we planned, I'm done. I think it's probably because we witnessed so many of these celebrity weddings. They spend gobs and gobs of money to have some kind of elaborate show, but yet they last so pitifully. Uh, they, they last so pitifully short. Many of them get into what's called a prenuptial agreement. Basically, you know, if this doesn't work out, <laughs> I'm reserving certain rights and certain controls over certain, usually assets and things like that. But a prenup is only the plan for failure and an exit strategy. When we go into marriage, you don't want to have an exit strategy. Single people, before you're married, be a person who is committed and not haphazard in life. Learn commitment where you're at. Many won't get married because they don't like the commitment aspect. And then, they, and then they're upset why they're not married. Can I say, be a person who, who's committed to something. Can I say you can't enjoy the best of life regardless until you become a person who makes and keeps commitments to worthy endeavors? And marriage is a worthy endeavor. 
But if you can't even do it on the basic stuff, you're never going to get anything out of life. You know, everything in life that ever blooms and blossoms into something special has been as a result of somebody being committed to something worthy. If you don't like commitment, it's time to start learning some commitment. Because we need people who are committed. You know, we need people who are committed to Jesus Christ first and foremost. Regardless of what may come up in their life. You learn to be committed to him, you'll be committed to every other thing. If you're one of those who just can't commit to anything, and just if it starts getting a little tough, I'm just going to quit type of attitude, you'll quit on everything in life and get nothing. Be a committed person. Marriage requires commitment because times do get tough. Difficulties do arise. Sometimes the spouse isn't as lovely as you wish, but neither are you. The best marriages stay committed through thick and thin. And these are some, just a few thoughts, I believe, that will help us to maintain this thought of the permanence of God's plan. And there are many other things we could talk about, but I just want to give some basic thoughts so that as you approach your marriages, that you can take your responsibility seriously whatever it is, the, the, the role that you play, that you can make a decision to commit, and a single person that you realize that you have to, you, you, need to be, you need to look for the right people and not just what's available out there. <laughs> because what's, what's available may not be the best. We need to wait on God. May God help us tonight as we consider this subject matter. Let's stand for a few moments tonight for a word of invitation if we could.